All right, please take your Bibles and turn with me, if you will, to the book of Revelation. We're doing a study of one of the most exciting books in the entire Bible because it deals with the things yet to come, the things that we're looking at down the road and what's going to happen to the world in the end. We're in Revelation chapter 1, looking at verses 9 through 20, the Son of Man vision, part 3. I'll begin reading in verse 9. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation, and in the kingdom and presence the patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and... What thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned I saw seven golden candlesticks, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paths of the golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like into fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp, two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you once again for the privilege of being here to study your word. We pray, Father, that you will be in total control of all that is said and done here in this service. Father, I pray that there would be clarity in the exposition, clarity in the understanding, faithfulness and excitement as we consider the things to come. And so, Father, we pray for your blessings tonight on this, your word, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, last week we began an in-depth study of the term the day of the Lord because of the statement in verse 10, which says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia. That question about the Lord's Day was one that we dealt with in some detail last week. And we saw that this is one of the principal keys to the book of Revelation. As I explained last week, the Greek text literally speaks of the Lordish Day or Lordian Day. This is the only place in the entire Bible where we have the English phrase, the Lord's Day. That makes it highly significant that we define it correctly since there are no other passages where we can compare to determine its meaning. It's what is technically called in Greek studies a hapax legomena. In other words, it's a unique occurrence in all of the Bible. There are no other New Testament passages using this phrase where we can compare the contexts. Although modern Americans use the term the Lord's Day to refer to Sunday, the, the phrase is clearly not talking about Sunday, which the New Testament consistently calls the first day of the week. And we looked at a lot of passages in relation to that. 
specifically because Christians are no longer under the Sabbath regulations. Sunday is not the so-called Christian Sabbath. As I mentioned last week, and I'm going to add a little bit to that from last week, in the Old Testament there were both weekly Sabbaths and special high holy days which were called Sabbaths also. Now some of you are probably aware of the fact that yesterday was Yom Kippur. That was commanded by God in the Old Testament. That's the Day of Atonement. It's found in Leviticus 17, and it's supposed to be a time of national repentance. Although the Jews today celebrate it much more as a celebration than as a day of repentance. This year it happened to fall on Saturday, but that's not always the case. We are just about to enter into the Feast of Sukkot, or Sukkoth, as they say in English, but Sukkot is the name of the feast. That's the Feast of Tabernacles, or the Feast of Booths, B-O-O-T-H-S, to commemorate the wilderness wanderings when God provided for his people and they dwelt in tents in the wilderness. This year, Sukkot starts on Thursday, October the 5th, so it's not on a Saturday. Sometimes, the High Holy Sabbaths fall on different days of the week, but the weekly Sabbath is always on Saturday, every time it is mentioned in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. So to understand the question of the Lord's Day, and thus to understand prophecy as it relates to Israel and the Church, we must, and you've heard me say this many times, we must distinguish between Israel and the Church. They are not one and the same. Just like the High Holy Day Sabbaths and the weekly Sabbaths were given as a sign to Israel of their special national relationship with God, neither the High Holy Sabbaths nor the weekly Sabbaths were ever given to the church as a sign of anything. You don't celebrate Yom Kippur. You probably didn't know it was there yesterday. You're not in the process of about to celebrate Sukkot. You're not going to celebrate the Feast of Trumpets, you know, or the other things that our Lord Jesus Christ prophetically will fulfill some of those. Day of Atonement, of course, was fulfilled when Christ died on the cross. But the Feast of Trumpets is still future. Someday maybe we'll have a chance to go through all the feasts of Israel. The church has not been given those things as a sign of anything, but they were given to Israel as a sign of their relationship with God. The church has been given only two signs to show our relationship to God, and they are baptism and the Lord's table, which we celebrated this morning. God specifically says that the Sabbath is a sign between himself and Israel perpetually. God is talking to Moses here, and he says, Speak thou unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbath ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you might know that I am the Lord that does sanctify you. Ye shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy unto you. Every one that defileth it shall surely be put to death. For whosoever doeth any work therein, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Six days may work be done, and in the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. Whosoever doeth any work in the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Wherefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. And verse 17, it is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. And as I think I pointed out last week, that if you want to claim Sunday as the Sabbath and the church is Israel, you must transfer the entire Sabbath law to the church, not just the parts that you want or like. Sabbath violation required the death penalty, verse 14. If you worked on the Sabbath, you were killed. Have you ever worked on Sunday? Have you ever worked on Saturday? Remember, the law is a unit. You cannot take it piecemeal. James says so. James 2.10. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. For he that said, Do not commit adultery, said also, Do not kill. Now if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. And then we saw many, many verses on different subjects related to that. I'll not read them all. But we learned that you're not under the law and you're not justified by the law. That's very, very clear in the book of Galatians. Much time is spent on that. We find that in Acts. We find that in Romans. We find that certain sections of the law, for example, nine of the Ten Commandments, 
were restated in the New Testament, but on a totally different basis. The Sabbath is the only one of the Ten Commandments that is not restated in the New Testament after Pentecost. In the New Testament, Sunday is never referred to as the Sabbath. Sunday is always referred to as the first day of the week in the New Testament. That's true in all four Gospels, it's true in the book of Acts, and it's true in the Epistles. And we looked at many references on that. So in other words, it would be very strange for John to be using the phrase the Lordian day to speak of Sunday in light of the consistent usage of the rest of the New Testament calling Sunday the first day of the week. However, using that term the Lordian day makes perfect sense to understand the phrase in light of the majority of the context of the book of Revelation, which is primarily concerned with the day of the Lord. The Hebrew phrase used throughout the Old Testament is the day of the Lord. This very specific period set out in the Old Testament in detail. We're going to be looking at some of those tonight. The New Testament adds additional details. When the day of the Lord arrives, the church, which is a mystery in the Old Testament, is nowhere in sight. Now that we have the New Testament, we know the reason. It was because the entire church age, from beginning through its content to its very end, is never seen in the Old Testament. The church does not appear in the Old Testament. It's not revealed until Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. Second, since the church is raptured prior to the tribulation, we would not expect to find the first day of the week called the Lord's Day during the tribulation period as described in Revelation. So we look now at the day of the Lord. When the Old Testament closed, the day of the Lord had not yet come. It was still in anticipation. The day of the Lord has not yet come during this period of divine history, which we call the church age. Paul made it clear that the day of the Lord is still future in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. And on that basis, he makes a practical application of how we should be living since the Lord has not yet arrived. But of the times and seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, not us, when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as prevail upon a woman with child, and they, I hope you see those thems and theys in there, but ye, brethren, now here we have the yees, but ye, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. Do you get it? There's a difference between them and us. Paul is talking about those who are going to go through the day of the Lord. Let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet the hope of salvation. And then verse 9, very clearly stated, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. That's a very clear passage where Paul contrasts us, the believers, with them, the unbelieving world, and specifically states that we're not going to suffer the wrath of God. We suffer his discipline because we're his children, but his wrath is what is described in the book of Revelation and in every passage in the Old Testament that deals with the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is always related to Christ's second coming. In every passage, never to his first coming. You don't find, for example, in Isaiah 7.14 concerning the birth of Christ, or Isaiah 9.6 as to what he's like. You don't find the first coming prophecies tied to the day of the Lord. It's never related to the rapture other than the fact that it starts immediately after the rapture. It begins with a period referred to as the 70th week of Daniel. I mentioned that last week, which specifically and distinctly relates to Israel. And I hope that we'll have time at one point as we get into the book of Revelation where we can talk about that 70th week of Daniel. It's a fantastic prophecy, and it was made uh, 489 years or so before the Lord Jesus Christ was born. It extends from his coming as a thief in the night to the destruction and melting of the current heavens and earth. So there are some very major passages that we looked at. One of the passages was the Olivet Discourse. We're not going to read that again. But Israel and not the church is in view. We noted that the motif of a thief in the night is repeated multiple times. We saw this all the way through. In Matthew 24, there's an emphasis 
on four things. That passage, that big, long, huge, hairy passage I read to you last week has an emphasis on four things. If you didn't get this last week, here's time to write it down. Four major themes in Matthew 24. Number one, the temple. That's where the whole thing starts out in Matthew 24, where the disciples are going to show him the temple, and Jesus says every stone here is going to be ripped down and thrown away. The second thing, and the temple relates to the Jews, to Israel. The second major point that has been is dealt with that gives us the hint that this is related to Israel is the Sabbath day. Jesus tells them, pray that your flight won't be on the Sabbath day. And as we've seen, the church is not under the Sabbath law. The third thing that we find that stands out in that passage is that he's talking about Jerusalem and Judea. That doesn't relate to the church. And the fourth thing that he talks about are signs, because they ask the question, what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? The disciples were looking for signs because they were Jews. And God had given them multiple signs in the Old Testament. We'll see some of that in just a bit. Multiple signs. They're looking for signs. Well, why would they be looking for signs just because they're Jews? Well, remember what Paul said to the church at Corinth about signs? 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22. For the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. There's a difference in what Jews and Gentiles are looking for. Paul says, but we preach Christ crucified. Under the Jews a stumbling block and under the Greeks foolishness. In other words, we're not preaching signs, says Paul, and we're not preaching worldly wisdom. We're preaching Christ. Our focus is not on signs, our focus is on Jesus. According to Paul, the Jews are the ones who need and seek after signs. Now let me give you some important statistics so that you will see the weight of the evidence. I hope you're taking notes. There are 67 verses in the Bible talking about signs where the word sign, singular, occurs 76 times. 67 where you find sign in the singular, and in those 67 verses, that term sign occurs 76 times. In other words, sometimes a verse will have two or three mentions of that word sign. Second, of those 62 are in the Old Testament. 62 out of 67 are in the Old Testament and in the Gospels, which are all pre-cross. The church doesn't start until Acts 2, on the day of Pentecost. Jesus is in Israel talking to Jews about signs. So you find there are references in the Gospels clearly related to Jews. The Old Testament was given to the Jews who had grown accustomed to God proving things to them by signs. The Gospels record the ministry of Christ to Jews, primarily with only a few points of ministry to Gentiles, like the woman of Samaria, the Syrophoenician woman whose daughter was healed, the servant of the Roman centurion whom Jesus healed. Now, only five out of 67 verses using the term sign occur in the epistles and revelation, and of those five, three clearly refer to the Jews. That gives you two that you might say would refer to somebody else. So in other words, out of the 67 verses and the 76 times that that word in the singular appears, only two of them out of 67, or that is out of 74 usages of the word, only two don't refer or can be argued not to refer to the Jews. Let me give you a few illustrations out of the Old Testament. And we start off with uh, Moses and the children of Israel uh, in the book of Exodus. 
God speaking, and it shall come to pass if they will not believe thee, neither hearken to the voice of the first sign, that they will believe the voice of the latter sign. How about Exodus chapter 8, verse 23? And I will put a division between my people and thy people. Tomorrow shall this sign be. Chapter 13, verse 9. And it shall be a sign unto thee upon thine hand, and for a memorial between thine eyes, that the Lord's law may be in thy mouth. For with a strong hand hath the Lord brought thee out of Egypt. Folks, this is Jews. Very, very clearly. Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbath ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that ye may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. Exodus 31, 17. Speaking again of the Sabbath, It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. Numbers chapter 16, verse 38. The censors of these sinners... Nadab and Abihu, the censors of these sinners and Korah and his company against their own souls, let them make broad plates for a covering of the altar, for they offered them before the Lord, therefore they are hallowed, now listen, and they shall be a sign unto the children of Israel. Are you getting the idea? I'm going to read you a few more because I want you to get the overwhelming evidence that signs are for the Jews. You're not looking for signs, you're looking for Jesus. There are no signs that have to happen before Christ can return for his bride, the church. Signs relate to Israel. About X, uh, Numbers chapter 26, verse 10, we'll be talking about that next week, the Lord willing, in the morning worship service. And the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up together with Korah. When that company died, what time the fire devoured 250 men, and they became a sign. It was assigned to Israel. You get out of line with God and he will smack you so hard, you'll go straight down to hell. Those are serious issues and they relate to Israel. God was teaching them a lesson. Deuteronomy 13.1 If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and giveth thee a sign or a wonder... And the sign of the wonder come to pass, whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods, when thou hast not known, and let us serve them. You're supposed to put him to death, because the devil makes signs too. Deuteronomy 28, 46. This shall be unto thee a sign, and for a wonder, and upon thy seed, that is, Jews, forever. Joshua 4, 6. That this may be a sign unto you, that when your children ask their fathers the time to come, saying, What mean ye by these stones? In other words, they put those stones in the Jordan River as a sign to Israel. This is the place that we crossed over. It has nothing to do with us, folks. Judges 6, 7, and he said unto him, Here's Gideon, If now I have found grace in thy sight, then show a sign that thou talkest with me. Judges 20, 38. Now there was appointed an appointed sign between the men of Israel and the liars in wait, that they should make a great flame and smoke rise out of the city. 1 Samuel 2, 31. Here's Eli and his sons Hophni and Phinehas, who have carried the Ark of the Covenant into battle against the Philistines. Samuel has just told Eli that because he did not control his household and he was letting his sons steal from the offerings and sleep with the women who came to worship at the tabernacle, he was going to kill them. This shall be a sign unto thee that shall come upon thy two sons, a sign to you, Eli, the Jewish high priest, on Hophni and Phinehas, in one day they shall die both of them. Are you getting the idea? The altar also was rent. This is 1 Kings 13, 5. And the ashes poured out from the altar according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. 2 Kings 19, 29. And this shall be a sign unto thee. Ye shall eat this year such things as grow of themselves, and in the second year that which springeth up of the same, and in the third year sow and reap and plant vineyards and eat the fruits thereof. That's not a sign to the church. That was a sign to Israel. 
Isaiah chapter 7, verse 11. Ask thee a sign of the Lord thy God. Here's Hezekiah asking for a sign. He's a Jewish king. Ask it either in the depth or in the height above. You know, he wanted the dial of Ahaz to go back. But God says, here's the sign I'm going to give you. Verse 14, and you know this. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel, God with us. Here's Isaiah having to act out a sign. The Lord said, Like as my servant Isaiah hath walked naked and barefoot three years for a sign and wonder upon Egypt and upon Ethiopia to Israel. This is a sign unto thee from the Lord that the Lord will do this thing that he hath spoken. Hezekiah also had said, What is the sign that I shall go up to the house of the Lord? He'd been sick. Isaiah 55, 13, Instead of the thorn shall come up the fir tree, instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree, and it shall be to the Lord for a name for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. Millennial promises to Israel. Isaiah 66, 19, And I will set a sign among them and will send those that escape of them unto the nations, to Tarshish, Pul, Lud, and that draw the bow, to Tubal and Javan, to the isles afar of off, that they have not heard my fame, neither seen my glory, and they shall declare my glory among the Gentiles. Jews being sent to the far corners of the earth as a testimony of the Messiah. O ye children of Benjamin, gather yourselves to flee out of the midst of Jerusalem, and blow the trumpet into Koa, and set up a sign of fire in Beth Hakarim. For evil appeareth out of the north in great destruction. This shall be a sign unto you, saith the Lord, that I will punish you in this place, that you may know that my word shall surely stand against you for evil. Spoken to Israel. Ezekiel chapter 4. Will overtake unto thee an iron pan, and set it for a wall of iron between thee and the city, and set thy face against it, and it shall be besieged, and thou shalt lay siege against it. This shall be a sign to the house of Israel. I hope you get it. The Jews seek a sign. The Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. There's a difference between Jews and Gentiles and the church, which is composed of both Jews and Gentiles, on an entirely new set of revelatory messages that God gave in the New Testament. The church was a mystery in the Old Testament. The church now is revealed unto the apostles and prophets by the Spirit, Ephesians chapter 3. Say, I am your sign, like as I have done, so it shall it be done unto them. They shall remove and go into captivity. That's to the Jews. Verse 11 talks about it also. Ezekiel chapter 14. I will set my face against that man and will make him a sign and a proverb, and I will cut him off from the midst of my people that ye may know that I am the Lord. Ezekiel writing to Jews. Ezekiel 20, verse 12. Moreover, I also I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify them. Ezekiel quoting the book of Deuteronomy. Ezekiel 20, 20. And hallow my Sabbaths, and they shall be a sign between me and you that you may know that I am the Lord your God. 24, 24, thus Ezekiel is unto you a sign, according to all that he hath done shall ye do when this cometh, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God. Verse 27, in that day shall my, thy mouth be opened to him which is escaped, and thou shalt speak, and be no more dumb, and thou shalt be a sign unto them, and they shall know that I am the Lord. Chapter 39, where we're dealing with the battle of Gog and Magog. And we'll be talking about that when we get a little farther into the book of Revelation. But Ezekiel 39, 15 says, And the passengers that pass through the land, when they seeth any man's bone, then shall he set up a sign by it till the bearers have buried it in the valley of Hamon Gog. Oh man, Ezekiel 37, 38, 39. Fantastic passages that deal with many of the things that we see in the book of Revelation. In the Gospels, we find the word sign in the singular also. And notice who's asking for signs. Matthew chapter 12, verse 38. 
Then certain of the scribes and Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. And you know what he's talking about is his death, burial, and resurrection, three days in the tomb, as, as Jonah was three days in the belly of the great fish or the great whale. Matthew 16, verse 1. The Pharisees also of the Sadducees came, and tempting him, desired him that he would show them a sign from heaven. Verse 4 says, A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. Twice in Matthew we find Jesus having to deal with this problem. And there shall no sign be given unto it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas, and he left them and departed. And then we get to Matthew chapter 24, which we read extensively last week. Verse 3, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. So this is not a big, huge group. It's the disciples alone, and they're all Jews, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming? They're looking for signs. What's going to be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? We want to see a sign. We want to know what we're supposed to be looking out for when we get to the end of the world. Jesus talks to them at the end of that passage in verse 30. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And all the tribes of the earth shall mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. If we had time to study that Matthew 24, rather than just covering it briefly in this context, the sign of the Son of Man is the Shekinah glory of God. The Lord Jesus Christ is the resident of the Shekinah which appeared as a flame of fire and as a pillar of cloud that led Israel in the Old Testament. It was the Shekinah glory that rested over the goat hair tent, over the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies, where the blood was spread on the mercy seat. And the book of Hebrews tells us that Jesus is our Hilasterion, Jesus is our mercy seat. The sign of the Son of Man is the Shekinah, the Shekinah glory of God. Who's he coming back to earth for? Not the church. We're with him. We're coming back, according to Revelation chapter 19, with him, riding on white horses as he comes back to earth to judge. And that's why the earth mourns. They see him coming with power and great glory. Here we have Judas. What's he going to do? He's going to give a sign. Now he that betrayed him gave them a sign. Gave who? Jews a sign. Saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, that same as he. Hold him fast. We see the same kind of passages in Mark and Luke and over in John. They're always asking for a sign. Every one of those passages in the gospel is directed at Jews. When we get to the Acts, Epistles, and Revelation, we find sign in the singular in Acts chapter 28, 11. But it has nothing to do with God giving a sign. Listen. After three months, we departed in a ship of Alexandria, which had wintered in the isle, whose sign was Castor and Pollux. That's not giving God, God giving a sign to anybody. Here are the verses in the epistles that speak of signs to the Jews. Romans 4.11 And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had, yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. The sign of circumcision given to the Jews. And, of course, the reference we started with, 1 Corinthians 1.22, for the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. And then we get to Revelation. That's the only other one that we find here in the New Testament as it relates to Jews. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. 
There is only one verse that might be used to support signs for Gentiles, but obviously the overwhelming evidence in both the Old Testament and New Testament supports the statement of, of Paul, signs are for the Jews. And here's the one that some people like to argue about. 1 Corinthians 14, 22. Therefore tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not, but prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. And of course, we dealt with that in detail when we went through the spiritual gifts. Now, let's look now at the term signs as it occurs in the plural. All those references that I just read to you all deal with sign, singular, a specific sign. All of those, almost all of those, relate to the Jews alone. Now, let's look at the plural. The term signs in the plural occurs 52 times in 53 different verses in the Bible. Now, listen to the balance here. 40 times the term signs, plural, is used in the Old Testament. So the heaviest weight of evidence is the Jews require a sign because 40 of those times it shows up in the Old Testament. There are only 12 times in Acts and the Epistles where the term signs, plural, shows up. And of those 12 times, nine of the times the term signs is used in the Gospels, is speaking to Jews. The other two times the term sign occurs, it refers to the Antichrist. Further reducing the number of 12 so that we find the term signs is used concerning what the apostles did outside the context of Jews only five times. I hope you get the point. So, First, in the Old Testament, there's only one occurrence where the term signs is used outside the context of Jews. It's in the book of Genesis. But Genesis was given to Jews, so that makes this usage understandable to them as proof of the divine creatorship. I hope you remember this verse, Genesis 1.14. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. That's the only one we're not, not speaking directly to Jews because God is speaking before anybody is created. All the rest of the times in the Old Testament where the term sign, singular, or signs, plural, are found, it's in the context of Jews. Some passages dealing with a specific sign are quite well known to us. I quoted it to you a minute ago. Uh, for example, in the prophecies about the birth of the Messiah, therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Let me give you some of the illustrations of signs for the Jews. And we have here plural. Is Exodus chapter 4. It shall come to pass, if they will not believe these two signs, neither hearken unto thy voice, that thou shalt take water of the river, and pour it upon the dry land, and the water which thou takest out of the river shall become blood upon the dry land. God gave Moses signs for whom? The Jews. He's trying to convince the Jews that God is God, that they ought to obey him, and Pharaoh, he later throws him with plagues, but here are signs to help understand that God is God. Exodus 4.17, Thou shalt take this rod in thine hand, wherewith thou shalt do signs. Exodus 4.28, And Moses told Aaron all the words of the Lord who had sent him, and all the signs which he had commanded him. Verse 30, And Aaron spake all the words which the Lord had spoken unto Moses and did signs in the sight of the people. Are you getting the idea? Exodus 10, 2, And that thou mayest tell in the ears of thy son and thy son's son what things I have wrought in Egypt and my signs which I have done among them that ye may know that I am the Lord. Exodus, or Numbers chapter 14, verse 11. And the Lord said unto Moses, How long will this people provoke me? How long will it be ere they believe me for the, all the signs which I have showed among them? We're talking, folks, about Jews. I'm jumping over with my eyes multiple verses here. I mean, there's so many of them, it's, it's hard to choose which ones to give you. Here's one in Joshua. 
For the Lord our God, he it is that brought us up and our fathers out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, and which he did those great signs in our sight and preserved us in all the way wherein we went and among all the people through whom we passed. That's Jews to whom he's talking about the signs that God gave on their behalf. First Samuel 10, 7, And let it be, when these signs are come unto thee, that thou do as occasion serve thee, for God is with thee. Verse 9, And it was so that when he had turned his back to go from Saul, Samuel, God gave him another heart, and all those signs came to pass that day. Looking down farther here. Psalm 105, 27. They showed his signs among them and wonders in the land of Ham. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 18. Behold, I am the children whom the Lord hath given me are for signs and for wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts, which dwelleth in Mount Zion. Jeremiah. Chapter 32, and he brought forth thy people Israel out of the land of Egypt with signs and with wonders and with a strong hand, with a stretched out arm and with great terror. Daniel 4, 3, how great are his signs and how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, his dominion from generation to generation. Acts 2, 19, and I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor and smoke. Peter quoting out of the book of Joel. Ye men of Israel, verse 22, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, that is, you men of Israel, as ye yourselves also know. Verse 43, and fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. We're still in Acts 2, which is all Jewish men. Chapter 4, verse 30, by stretching forth thine hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done in the, holy, uh, in the name of thy holy child Jesus. It's still a Jewish church. We don't even have Samaritans in yet until we get to Acts chapter 8. Acts 5, and by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. That's in the temple. That's Jews. Chapter 7, verse 36, with reference back to the Old Testament, he brought them out after they had showed wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness for 40 years. Now we find one verse where signs are mentioned in relation to Samaritans, who are half Jew and half Gentile. Acts chapter 8, 13. Then Simon himself believed also, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. We have one that relates to Gentiles. This is Acts chapter 14. Long time, therefore, they abode speaking boldly in the Lord, but these are apostolic gifts, which gave testimony unto the word of his grace and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. Here we have Jews and Gentiles in uh, Romans 15, 19. Through mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem, that's Jewish, unto Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. There are a few other limited times where apostolic signs are used of the apostles' uh, signs in general. 2 Corinthians 12, 12. Truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience, in signs and wonders and mighty deeds, mentioned twice in that verse. And then over in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 4, which is speaking of the apostles, God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders and diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. And then, of course, in the plural, we also find it, just as we did in the singular, signs are used to speak of Antichrist. Matthew 24, 24, for there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Those are obviously not signs being given by God. Over in Mark, chapter 13, 22, 
For false Christs and false prophets shall rise and shall show signs and wonders to do, seduce, if it were possible, even the elect. There is also one reference to signs in the epistles related to Antichrist. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Do you understand? Signs relate to the Jews. We find those who are doing deceitful signs, just like we found there was a false prophetess, Noadiah and also Jezebel in the book of Revelation. They're also imitations of signs, and we see much of that in the so-called signs and wonders movement today in the charismatic circles where all kinds of not merely foolish and idiotic things are being done, but demonic things are being done. We also see that our Lord Jesus Christ had to deal with the issue of signs in relation to Jews in the Gospels. Matthew chapter 16, verse 3. Jesus speaking, and he says, And in the morning it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and lowering. O ye hypocrites, can you not discern the face of the sky? You can discern the face of the sky, but can ye not discern the signs of the times? The Jews were looking for signs. Jesus did every one of the messianic miracles, every one of the signs that were prophesied in the Old Testament that would be done by the coming Messiah, and they rejected them. Mark chapter 16, verse 17. These signs shall follow them that believe. He's talking to the apostles. There's not to anybody else. All the apostles are Jewish. In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues and drink poison and all the other things. Verse 20. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, that is, with the disciples, with the apostles, and confirming the word with signs following Amen. And we move straight from there into the book of Acts and the day of Pentecost. Jews. We get over to Luke. Here we find the parallel of the Olivet Discourse. And great earthquakes shall be in diverse places and famines and pestilences and fearful sights and great signs shall there be from heaven. That's Jews seeing this during the tribulation period. Verse 25, and there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth, the stress of nations and perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. Folks, we see a bunch of that stuff. It's just the beginning. It's building up to the point where the church is raptured and suddenly all of these things will break loose simultaneously. We've just seen humongous hurricanes. There's the seas roaring. We've just seen massive earthquakes in Mexico toppling huge buildings, entire neighborhoods. Multiple hurricanes sweeping across Puerto Rico and they still don't have power. And they're still in desperate need of food distribution because of the desolation it did to that island. That's just the beginning of sorrows. The end is not yet. Jesus speaking again to the Jews. The Jews have been asking him questions. Then they answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? Don't you get it? He does those things. They are the sign. Jesus said unto them, this chapter 4, Except ye see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. The Jews require a sign that Greeks seek after wisdom. The Jewish apostles were clearly looking for a sign in Matthew 24. As he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? The book of Revelation is full of signs and what is happening to the Jews during the tribulation period. We'll be looking at those in detail as we go through the Old Testament and see how they relate back to the Old Testament prophecy given to the Jews as we look at Revelation. The point that I'm trying to make is that the church is not looking for signs although we can see them abounding all around the world. What the church is looking for is Christ, for his imminent return. There are no signs standing between us and the rapture of the church. 
Now, we also had mentioned that there were three other indicators in Matthew 24 that demonstrate that Jews, not Gentiles of the church, are the intended audience uh, of these particular indicators. Number one, the temple. Number two, the Sabbath. Number three, Jerusalem and Judea. We're not going to have time for those tonight because our time at this point is almost up. So I think I will skip this section here. <laughs> but at least we gave you a lot of new information tonight, and I hope that uh, it will be useful to you as you study the Old Testament. Remember, Israel is not the church, and the church is not just the Gentiles. The church is made up of both Jew and Gentile. It is a distinct entity, and Paul makes them clearly distinct. Jews, Gentiles, and the church of God. If you don't make that distinction, you will be confused all the time, confusing the second coming with the rapture of the church, which was a mystery in the Old Testament, but is now revealed unto the apostles and prophets by the Holy Spirit. So, Lord willing, uh, next week we'll pick up at that point. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you so much for your word and for its power. We thank you that you have made it abundantly clear that the signs are for Israel. And what we're dealing with in the book of Revelation are these signs over and over and over again. And Christ prophesied it. And the Old Testament prophesied it. And whenever we see signs showing up almost every time, it's related to Jews. Help us to make that distinction so that we will understand clearly why the rapture is before the tribulation and how the tribulation relates to the nation of Israel, which has been reborn in a day, and sometime will be humbled at the end of the tribulation before you and cry out for the Messiah, they will recognize finally that the Lord Jesus Christ is the only one who can deliver them. Father, once again, we thank you for your word. We've covered a lot of complex material tonight, although all very, really straightforward, but just the massive amount of evidence that's there, and we skipped over a lot of it. We thank you, Father, that you have given us your word. Not only the living word, your son, Jesus Christ, but the written word, so that we might know the truth and the truth might make us free. Father, we commit these things to you and pray your blessings upon your word as it's gone forth tonight, that it might not return unto you void, but that it might accomplish that which you please and that it might prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.